reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to Psalm 123. Psalm 123, prayer for mercy. This is one of the songs of ascent, uh, A-S-C-E-N-T, as the pilgrims were going up to worship the Lord on their high holy days of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. They would sing these songs of ascent, which are in the range of Psalm 123, and uh, they would just sing them as they marched along in large groups. And this is a prayer for relief from contempt. They were being uh, criticized. They were being uh, put down by their adversaries. We all know what that's like, don't we? And they asked the Lord for relief. They were suffering because of the contempt of others. You and I have suffered because of the contempt of others. Certainly the contempt of the devil and his his minions of, of uh, demonic spirits, but members of the family who are not loving us, friends so-called who are not really loving us, people at work, who knows where they are. And we all are subject to criticism. We're subject to persecution. Uh, the Lord does say, uh, well, blessed are the persecuted because uh, great is your reward in heaven, but it's still not easy to be persecuted. Not, uh, and especially if the contempt is because of your faith in Christ, that's real that's real persecution. Well, they're praying now for relief. And Lord, help me. Uh, I need your mercy and I need your relief. Well, it begins in verses 1 and 2 with trusting in the Lord. That's always the basis for any answered prayer, trusting in the Lord. And then asking for relief from contempt. I'll read the four verses. It's very short. Nice little song that they would sing. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease with the contempt of the proud. So they want mercy and they want relief because they're so tired of people who are speaking ill of them, treating them badly, of the contempt of others. And I know you and I can identify with that as well. And the Lord can too. Jesus certainly suffered contempt even in the final hours. He who came to do good, who never did any harm, uh, the contempt that he felt there as he was being spat upon on the cross and vilified and statements were being made that were so derogatory to him. The shame uh, of that experience, even stripping him naked on the cross. Uh, and, and his poor mother having to see that and the apostle John and others. Uh, just the contempt that he felt. What about the contempt that he feels now? There are those who not, not only don't love the Lord, but some who even hate him who speak ill of him. I've heard them do that, and you have as well. They speak with such contempt. Well, I'm not talking about the construction worker who hits his thumb and says the name of the Lord and maybe in vain. Uh, that's not really contempt necessarily. It's not, not constructive. It's not helpful. But there are those who really, really hate the Lord and um, for whatever reason. So let's go look into the uh, solution for that. Prayer is always the solution. Trust in the Lord, verses 1 and 2. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. And so he begins by saying, I'm looking to you. We look up because we know he's in heaven, although he's also in our hearts. But we have a tendency to look up, and that's fine. Uh, I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Look to the Lord when there's a problem. My late father used to say, why do we always go to the Lord last, as a last resort? Go to him first. Lord, 
I have this problem. People are treating me badly. I'm being persecuted. Contempt for no reason whatsoever. Unto you I lift up my eyes, Lord, O you who dwell in the heavens. So look to him. Turn to him first, last, and always. And uh, the attitude we ought to have about looking to the Lord is given here in a very interesting way. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. You're looking to the Lord for mercy. You're looking to the Lord for whatever you're looking for. But how are you looking? Occasional prayer? <coughs> 10 o'clock in the morning you pray. Two days later you think about it again and you lift up a prayer. Well, it's, that's good. It's better than nothing. We think of the Lord once every 48 hours, once a week, once a month. Whatever you do is good, but it could be a lot better. How about watching him constantly? Looking to him constantly. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Several illustrations come to mind, one which we've all experienced. You go into a restaurant and you have a server. And I respect servers, they are busy, they have a lot of customers to take care of. We understand that, and I'm not the only person there. But you would like to know that when you need something, that within a relatively short period of time, you can catch the attention of the server. And when you get a server who does acknowledge and does take care of you, you're grateful, and usually you reflect that in your tip. Um, and then once in a while you find a server that just seems to almost have what I call servant's eyes in the negative, meaning they just avoid you and look the other way, that gets you frustrated. Um, if you've ever been to a fine restaurant, I really haven't been to very many myself, once in a while, I think over in Europe, I went to a, a restaurant or two. Actually, I remember once going to a, a restaurant in Amsterdam, Holland, and um, being an American, I was kind of dumb about the eating time and walked in at six o'clock and go, oh, I'll leave, the place is empty. I'm the only, this is supposed to be a highly rated place here, and I'm the only person here. And there was this wait staff, and uh, they just looked at me as if I was the only customer because I was the only customer. And I asked uh, for some help with the menu, and they were there like that. It was wonderful. Uh, I had this staff, I had more than one person right there watching me and meeting all my needs. And uh, it was a good today. It was a good thing I went in at six o'clock because by seven o'clock, oh, it was it was really coming in. They, they eat later over there in Europe in many places, but it was nice to have that kind of attention. And uh, for those who were kings and lords in the time of David and even in England and elsewhere, they would have servants right there watching them constantly, constantly there to take their needs. That's one illustration. Be like that servant that I had in Amsterdam, Holland. Sir, what may I do to help you? And uh, just watching me to make sure that every need was met it was wonderful. I think it's the one time in my 81 years I've had that happen. But something I see every day, and if you're a dog owner and a dog lover, you see it all the time. Where is your dog's eyes most of the time? Unless they're playing or eating, where are they? What, where's, where's their eyes? They're watching you. They're watching you. And uh, we have a couple of dogs in the back right now. And uh, when I'm with them, they're watching me. They know that their lives depend upon it. The Lord spoke to me more than once and said, if you watched me the way your dogs watch you, you'd be a whole lot better off. I wouldn't get into the trouble that you get into. So those dogs know they, they survive by being in packs. They survive by watching the leader. And they're not looking for what you have to say. They're, listening, they're looking at your movements and they get to know your movements. We, we know this. You're, you're, have you ever had a dog? Um, cats, we, we have our cats too and I love them dearly. And the cats sometimes watch and sometimes they don't. They're more independent. But that dog will watch you and you don't need to say anything, you just move and they're right there. They know what you're going to do. Why don't we watch the Lord the way our dog watches us? Dogs have advantage over two people in two ways. They know they have to survive in packs, so they get along with each other. If they have trouble, new dog is coming into the pack, they settle it very quickly. 
You know how long it takes to find out who the top dog is going to be? Less than 60 seconds. A new dog comes in, there's a challenge, there's a rebuke, put down. Um, when we had a new puppy come in recently, and um, well, one of the dogs uh, uh, did something that was just very, very typical. It was a male against another male, uh, one that was about two years old versus a, a four-month-old that was acting up. And that, uh, that dog, it was Sammy, the, uh, the black poodle, just put his paw and bam, just lowered him to the ground. That was it. That's all it takes. Bam. And the, dog, the little guy looks up and Sammy's the boss. So, but, but dogs know how to survive in packs. They know how to uh, hang together. They know order. They know, they know who's top dog and who's second, who's third. And they survive that way. And another quality they have is they watch you closely, as I've already said. They watch you as the leader, and uh, they make sure that they know what's going on because their livelihood depends upon it. Um, one cute story about two friends that I, that I used to have, Fizz and Sparky, for those that have been around. You remember them, uh, Sedell. And uh, Sparky was a rescue dog out of uh, South Carolina, homeward bound, brought him up here. and we. Uh, he was one year old. He was about to be put down by the owner down there. Thank God he was saved. And uh, Sparky was all 13 pounds, just a little mountain feist, as they call them, just a little, uh, I call him a product of a roadside romance. Don't know what his lineage was. And um, we had him for about a year, and then somebody said, would you please rescue this rat terrier? He's in desperate need of a home. So we adopted Fizz. And Fizz came into the house that Friday night, and Sparky was so happy to have a friend, and they just got along fine. That was Friday night. Saturday morning, Sporky woke up. I thought there was only a one night situation here. Now he's still here, what's he doing here? And he was not happy. And he started to ignore Fizz. And he just, just totally ignored him. And poor Fizz didn't know what to do. It took Fizz 30 days to figure it out. Finally, you must have seen that movie about the helpless maiden who's uh, tied to the railroad tracks, and the evil guy is tied, and then the locomotive is coming, and she's crying, help, help. Fizz decides to be submissive and play the wounded female. Oh, oh. Sparky, all 13 pounds, raises his chest, and now he becomes the number one guy. That's all he needed. He had just acknowledge me as the boss, and then they got along just fine. German shepherds came into the picture, much bigger, much tougher. But little Sparky, er, that was it. He'd show those teeth. He was losing half of them, but he would show those teeth, and they would submit. A 130-pound German Shepherd, male, bark that could be heard from here to Utica, he would submit. They, they, they learn how to work together. My, what's my point? I'm not saying go out and get a dog. If you need dogs, we've got plenty to give you. But what's the point? Human beings aren't so smart. We haven't learned how to get together. We haven't learned how to work in order in our homes, in our nation, among the nations. We think that we can do it my way, as Frank Sinatra is saying. We, we don't realize we, we cannot survive on our own. We need to work with others. And the second point is, let's start looking at the leader. Let's get our eyes on Jesus. He's the top dog. Pardon the expression. You don't hear that too much in sermons, but he's the top dog. Keep your eyes on Jesus, and whatever he says to do, do it. Mary had the right advice about the wine, saying to the servants, hey, whatever he says to do, do it. That's it. So this is the value, um, really, of keeping your eyes on the Lord. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. We need your mercy, Lord. What's mercy? Favor, compassion, blessing, love, kindness. Verse 3, have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. Do you cry out to the Lord on that on a regular basis? That's a good prayer to pray every day. Have mercy on me, Lord. I'm a sinner. I'm a hopeless mess without you. Jesus said in John 15, two wonderful, uh, wonderful verse about the vine and the branches. He said, you know, you're, if, you, if you can't stay connected to me, no fruit's going to come in your life. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Have mercy, Lord. I can't do anything worthwhile apart from you. But then we have the wonderful words of Paul to the Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nothing without you, anything and everything with you, Lord. 
Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. I checked some other translations on that because I didn't feel comfortable with that one. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. That indicates that the contempt's in me and I'm angry. Well, you could, you could use that as a prayer. If, if you have contempt, uh, yes, you can say, have mercy, Lord, help me to get rid of this contempt. That's a viable prayer. I've got a lot of contempt in me and anger about situations and people, and Lord, heal me and free me from that. Yes, we should pray that. But that's not what they're saying here. But what he's saying here, we are exceedingly filled with contempt, meaning that we are the subject of contempt by our enemies. And that's also a reason to pray as they're praying here. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease. And here it gets clearer. There are those who are at ease, meaning they seem to have it well. They do their own thing. They're proud. They're arrogant. They don't have the Lord. They're free, if you will, to just be themselves and to live for the devil and live for the world and live for themselves. And so they're giving me a hard time, Lord. They're giving me a hard time. And they don't have the Lord to correct them. The Holy Spirit can't convict them because they don't receive the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I need help. Mm -hmm. So either way you want to look at it. Uh, I've got contempt for others. Lord, heal me for that. That's not right. But, Lord, there are so many that have contempt for me. So many who are proud and arrogant. Uh, not to mention the devil. Not to mention his pride. Which really set in motion the pride of Adam and Eve and and the fall of man, all based on pride. And so the natural man without Christ is filled with pride, filled with contempt, filled with arrogance. And we need to be protected from it. We're like sheep, as Jesus said. We're innocent as lambs, uh, wise as serpents, but harmless as doves, another analogy there. And so we're supposed to go about in this gentle and loving and submissive and humble way, looking to the Lord, not being arrogant, not being proud, not doing it our way. And yet we're in a world that mostly doesn't function that way. A world that really wants to put us down. A world that's uh, jealous of us, of our walk with God, takes advantage of us. We've got a situation in our family recently with somebody who was really subject to persecution on the job. They, they, they looked at her position of faith uh, on uh, social media and began to build uh, opposition and contempt for her, contempt. Mm -hmm. And just ignored her or was rude to her and didn't uh, give her the peace that she needed to function in. A lot of prayers went up for her by this church and God delivered. God delivered and, and placed her in a, in a new position where she's being respected and given a lot of opportunity now to show the, the grace of God, the mercy of God and the ability of God. But we all go through contempt and we need to pray for God's help. But don't, don't fight it on your own. That's the important thing here. No, don't fight the contempt. If you try to fight it on your own, you try to defend yourself on your own, battle on your own, you'll be on your own. But give it to God. Not only will he give you the victory, he already has given the victory. He has given the victory already. Just give it to him. Lord, I'm being persecuted. If I'm doing something wrong, change me. If not, then help me, Lord, to look to you for mercy and deliverance. And when you get to heaven, there'll be rewards there for the persecution you suffered for the cause of Christ. So pray for mercy. Pray to keep your eyes on Jesus. And pray to be able to really have the peace of Jerusalem in your heart. Pray for Jerusalem. Pray for Israel. Pray for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for the chance to study your word tonight. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on Israel and Jerusalem. And Lord, may we show the peace of God to all. Your shalom. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. This moment your needs to supply Reach out and touch the Lord As 
Jesus.